What follows is a really beautiful conversation I had with Professor Mark Soames. Mark Soames is a neuropsychologist and neuropsychoanalyst at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He is also the director of the Neuroscience Institute at the same university. He is credited for being the discoverer of the brain mechanisms for dreaming, which he narrates very well in his book, The Hidden Spring, A Journey to the Source of Consciousness. So in this conversation, we talk about a number of things, but largely about consciousness, which is where today he directs a lot of his research effort. He talks about um, what they are trying to do currently with a couple of his collaborators, which is to build a conscious artificial agent, which is going to be based on a lot of the theory that he, together with his collaborators, have been able to build over the years. It's a very interesting conversation and it touches a lot of touches upon a lot of the things that I find very interesting and I hope you find it interesting too. Unfortunately, the audio quality is not so great owing to my microphone in my computer, which I think has been damaged by water. But uh, other than that, I think it's a great conversation and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did because I had a ball. Hey, before that starts, I have a plea to you. So I'm the kind of person who finds great pleasure in learning and sharing with you guys the kind of things that I get to learn on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're the kind of person who is interested in all the things that I have to say based on the content that I've delivered and this video, may you please, please like this video and also subscribe to the channel so that you can get to enjoy all the future content that I have to create. Now, back to the video. Thank you. Um, Prof. Mark Souls, thank you for agreeing to come on the channel with me. I've been interested in questions such as consciousness um, for a long time. I remember the first video I posted on this YouTube channel was in 2017. So I realized that was six years ago now. And it was about free will. Uh, so that was when I was interested in it at the time. Um, so quite recently, I saw, I think the university tweeted uh, that he had received a grant to study something to do with consciousness. And then I was like, hey, this is someone I think I'd be interested in talking to. So thank you so much for agreeing to, to talk to me. It's a very great pleasure, especially to be talking to a compatriot of mine. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, likewise. Um, so you are quite a name within the field of neuroscience and psychoanalysis. And I suppose this popularity is earned based on the work you've done with dreams and your bringing psychoanalytic thoughts to um, modern neuroscience and you do currently your efforts towards understanding consciousness. But for the people that don't know you, um, may you please introduce yourself, touch upon where you were born um, and raised and what your professional training looks like and what you do currently. Thanks. Yes, I'll gladly do that. I was born um, of South African parents, but I was born in Namibia. Um, my my father worked for De Beers, uh, the diamond mining company. Uh, so um, I grew up there uh, in, in a very sort of weird environment. Uh, my my brother, my older brother, sustained a, a, a a traumatic brain injury uh, when we were little, and I think that that um, had a decisive influence on my uh, subsequent uh, professional life because I was, um, I was, what's the word? I was sort of exposed to uh, the re reality uh, that that we are our brain, uh, and 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 had to somehow, if you'll excuse the pub, get my head around that, you know. Uh, how come because my brother's brain has been damaged, he's no longer the same person? Um, wh wh where where's he gone to? And who's this guy? You know, and that sort of thing. I I I, I don't want to uh, caricature it, but I do think that uh, that was the beginning of the kind of um, uh, mental uh, focus that that ultimately led me to just become a neuroscientist. Uh, so I trained. Um, the, the, the branch of neuroscience that I was interested in, for obvious reasons, was neuropsychology, because, you know, that's where these two things come together. Uh, uh, the, uh, and so I trained at Bits University in Johannesburg uh, in the early 1980s in that field. And um, I was uh, 
very soon uh, disappointed and frustrated by what I learned because there was no mind there. You know, it was just brain. Uh, so the, as uh, Oliver Sacks uh, later uh, put it, uh, he said, neuropsychology is admirable, but it excludes the psyche. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's exactly what, what I uh, encountered. And so that is why I um, studied uh, my first major research interest was brain mechanisms of, of sleep uh, and, uh, and via that uh, brain mechanisms of dreaming. You know, the only aspect of consciousness which was a respectable topic in neuropsychology in the early 1980s, I mean, people forget it now. People don't know it now, but it was, you know, uh, if you said to, uh, as I did, to my supervisors, you know, I want to study consciousness, they said, don't go there, you know, it's bad for your career. Uh, so the only aspect that was respectable was the sleep-waking cycle, you know, consciousness in its most rudimentary form. So you could study that. Uh, and so the most interesting thing about sleep uh, is that, you know, it is interrupted by um, periods of consciousness. I mean, it is really paradoxical that you are asleep and yet you have conscious experiences. And so those are what we call dreams. And so I, um, it was in a desperate attempt to study something of the mind uh, that I, that I, uh, uh, that I, my research took me in that direction. Um, I have to say, uh, it's not difficult to understand why there was such reluctance to, to study the psyche in neuropsychology. Uh, and that's because it is, the mind is, let's face it, first and foremost, something subjective. I mean, what is the mind if not something subjective? Uh, each of us can only experience, uh, in other words, observe directly our own mental states. And uh, to the science aspires to objectivity. So, you know, how do you study the subject uh, of the mind uh, using um, objective scientific um, methodology? So, uh, but my feeling was that uh, you don't, you can't exclude the psyche from psychology. I mean, for heaven's sake, it's part of nature. You know, the, well, uh, the mind exists and subjective experience exists. Uh, and if you leave it out of account, you're never going to understand uh, how how it works. I mean, the, 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 the most unique property of the brain uh, is that it is capable of subjective experience. And uh, surely this evolved for a reason. Uh, and surely uh, the subjectivity, uh, the experiential uh, aspect of the brain does something. Uh, it, you know, so if you leave that out, you're never going to understand how, how the brain works. And so that was my starting point. My feeling was you don't adjust your object of study to the tools that you have. You must adjust the tools that you have to the object of study. Uh, so the mind exists, so we have to find ways of, of studying it in its own terms. And so that was why um, I, I, I took the a very unusual step uh, of trading as a psychoanalyst. And my colleagues were appalled. Uh, they said it's like an astronomer trading in astrology. You know? uh, but for all of its faults, Psychoanalysis uh, uh, it takes um, as its starting point the fact that the mind is subjective. Uh, its methods uh, 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 start from that brute fact. Uh, and as I said, I think that's the correct approach, that you must adjust the methods to the, to the thing you're studying, not the other way around. Um, and so because it has been doing so for more than 100 years, uh, it's developed uh, a... Um, a theoretical um, infrastructure uh, and, and, and concepts, you know, terms for, for conceptualizing uh, these things that the mind uh, is constituted of, you know, the, the, these, these, these uh, ephemeral uh, subjective things uh, are rigorously conceptualized within that framework. So, if you cut a long story short, what I wanted to do was to bring those concepts uh, and methods into the neurosciences so that we can bring the psyche into neuropsychology and uh, and then build on that on that you know it's, it's go, go from there so as I, as I said I started with dreams I then moved on uh, I, I won't give you a summary of my entire scientific life but I, I have come to uh, now at the 
I, well, I don't want to say at the end because hopefully I've still got a few years to go. But yeah. but the culmination of all of that is uh, where I am now, which is studying um, consciousness itself. Uh, you know, uh, so I, m my main uh, uh, focus now is is um, the the famous hard problem of consciousness, uh, which is exactly um, you know what we've been talking about now. Uh, in other words, how do we incorporate within our natural scientific uh, Weltanschauung uh, the the, the the brute factor of subjectivity. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for that will and um, <laughs> and take, take you after your your younger career. Um, I was going to ask actually. I didn't want to throw this question, but I think you actually answered it because I was wondering as I was preparing these questions for you. Like, why is consciousness such a hot topic right now? Why is it the thing that we're studying right now? Because when you look at the history of science, you 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 hear about people such as Ronas Templar, you know, and Copernicus and Galileo and Newton, and these people made very huge strides trying to study the heavenly bodies somewhere, you know, uh, very very far from us, I and mean, they made a lot of progress, but they didn't intend to look into ourselves and stand the thing that is us. Um, but then I guess the answer, as you said, science aspires to objectivity and consciousness and the mind, as you said, is quite a subjective thing. Um, so, another interesting thing, um, when I was reading a book, I realized me, when I was an undergrad student at, at UCT, um, whenever I'd log into the learning platform, I would see an advertisement for a course that said, what is the mind? Um, but I was so busy at the time, so I saw one of my engineering courses and didn't pay that much attention. And as I was reading the book, I was like, I suspect that Prof. Sons was the one who taught that course. So I went back and looked and realized to my pleasant surprise, it was indeed you. Um, so please tell us, uh, what is the mind? Um, so that, that was a, uh, an online, uh, course. Um, it's called a MOOC, a massive, uh, uh, uh online open classroom. Uh, yeah. And it was uh, commissioned by UCT, uh, uh, the, 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 the university that you just mentioned, which uh, is your alma mater and where I am a professor uh, uh, today. Um, and uh, it was on the Future, Law, Future Learn platform. Um, it, it was, and it's still available. That's why I'm mentioning all of this in case anybody wants to look at it. Uh, it, it was an attempt to answer that question, which uh, you, you can see uh, builds on what we were just talking about, you know, the, the, the question, what is a mind? Um, I'm sorry, my phone is making noises in the background. Let me just turn that down. Um, the, the, um, the, I, 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 uh, would like to ask my students uh, who are studying neuropsychology, I start my, my course by asking them, what is a mind? Uh, because you know you're studying neuropsychology. Psychology is the science of the mind, and it is really quite astonishing. Uh, by the time they come to me, you know they're postgraduates, um, so they've already got a degree in psychology, and they have great difficulty uh, t telling me what a mind is. You know, which I think really says a lot. Um, so what I what I uh, say to them, uh, and in this course, which the online course, which is just a a, a um, sort of expanded version of what I say to them in my introductory lecture um, is first and foremost the mind is something subjective you know and that we mustn't shy away from that that is what the mind is it's something subjective uh, and then I say secondly um, if subjectivity uh, is just a observational perspective it is just you know if you take this perspective of being something uh, as opposed to as opposed to observing it uh, from the outside, objectively, uh, if you observe from the inside, subjectively, you, that, that is the being of the thing, but if, um, as opposed to you know the the external, uh, the objective perspective. It's the subjective thing, and I, I, I put it like that to them because uh, I want to make the point that there is uh, that you could speak of the being of anything. You know, you could say uh, this is my mind is the being of Mark Souls. Uh, but what is the being uh, of a table? Uh, uh, and so that introduces the second uh, aspect of what a mind is, 
if the mind is not just subjectivity, uh, the mind is something uh, that w when you uh, take the subjective observational perspective, uh, there is something it is like to be that thing. Uh, this is Nagel's, Thomas Nagel, the philosopher, who wrote that wonderful paper in 1974 called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Um, and uh, uh, in, in which he says we can never have a science of subjectivity because you can never know what it's like to be a bat. So, you know, you can, you can only know what it's like to be yourself. Um, so so I, I make the point that this, so first, it's the mind is subjective, but secondly, uh, it, it, it is capable of consciousness. In other words, uh, you can only speak of uh, a, a, a mental subjectivity uh, if, you, if, if there is something it is like, if it feels like something to be uh, a, 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 this thing. So th then I lead to the third point. Uh, I must hasten to tell you there only are four points, so don't worry. Uh, the, 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 the third point is that the mind is not synonymous with consciousness, uh, that there are, there are um, mental functions which are performed unconsciously. Uh, Freud famously introduced us to this, to this. Uh, well, let me say fact, uh, because it simply is obviously the fact. It's now empirically demonstrated abundantly so that you know we have uh, perception without awareness of what we perceive. We have learning without awareness of what we've learned, uh, and uh, you know you can only call these functions perception, uh, memory, uh, and, and whatnot mental functions. Uh, so clearly there are mental functions that go on unconsciously. And um, so when I said earlier um, that uh, the mind uh, is not only subjective, but it is also a, 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 a thing that feels like something, uh, what, what do we, how do we, uh, in what way is the aspect of the mind that does not feel like something, uh, the unconscious part of the mind, in what, in what way is that mental? Um, and so that leads me to the view uh, that what uh, what um, what characterizes that um, uh, unconscious mental functioning as mental is the fact that it is intentional. Uh, it, that there is there is an intentionality uh, in those states. So when I asked you, is your computer uh, conscious? Uh, I, I could say, well, there must, you know, there is such a thing as being a computer. Uh, I'm busy sitting in front of one now, you know, but I doubt very much uh, whether it feels like anything to be a computer. Uh, it, it's functioning unconsciously. Uh, but in what way is that different from my computer in my head uh, when it's functioning unconsciously? I, I think that's the difference. That um, to to quote Daniel Dennett, another philosopher, he said, the computer doesn't give a damn. It hurt. So that's what I mean by intentionality. You're trying to achieve something. Uh, you, you, and that something that you're trying to achieve is not um, just programmed into you. Uh, it is something that you are trying to achieve that comes from within you, from your own volition. Um, and that is uh, at the heart of um, actually not just the mind, but all biology. All living things are trying to achieve something. What is that? They're trying to survive. They're trying to cont continue existing. Um, yeah. And so uh, the unconscious mental processes uh, are intentional in that sense, that they are, uh, let me put it, um, uh, uh, yeah, I should say it's intentional in the volitional sense of the word, in the sense of giving a damn. And it's an existential uh, volition. It's, in other words, it's, it's something that matters to me, for me. Um, and it, whether it's conscious or, or unconscious, it's still serving the purpose uh, of the the, um, the the great imperative to survive uh, for all living things. And then um, m the fourth and last feature uh, of the mind uh, is that it, it 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 comes in degrees. You know, you can say uh, the mind of a fish. I mean, I'm perfectly happy to attribute mental functions to a zebrafish uh, for for good experimental reasons. I'm perfectly happy to. To to um, uh, accept that a fish uh, has a mind, but does a fish have as much of a mind as we? You know, then this is what I mean by degrees. Yeah. So so that third element um, is, is is I I think of it. I use the word agency, uh, by which I refer, which I'm using in the sense of 
to what extent do you own your volition? So a fish has volition, uh, but how much choice does a fish have? You know, how much decision making goes on? Uh, and that is the, 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 you spoke of free will uh, at the beginning and that this leads us immediately into that sort of territory. But uh, I think that uh, to the extent that we have agency, in other words, ownership uh, of our own volition, to that extent, we have more mind uh, than uh, than uh, those creatures which have just basically in instincts and reflexes. Uh, they, 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 they are mental uh, in the sense that you know, the fish feels hungry and goes for the food, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have much deliberation about that. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of what we call mental that is missing uh, there. Yeah, I'd say it seems like say something like the fish is more than then you know it gives a damn, but you know it's it's largely just about survival and and and, and continuing for the fish. Yes, that's right. There's there it's a very really rudimentary mental processing. I'm I'm willing to call it mental, but uh, I, I do think uh, any definition of the mind needs to include uh, something which accommodates the difference between. Uh, as the the, the eponymous uh, the way that that's so often put, uh, I mean, mice versus men. Uh, I, I think that there's a there's a difference. Okay, but then um, I suppose then the computer is even below the fish because the computer doesn't really give a damn at all. Yes, I don't I don't attribute mental states to uh, to computers. Uh, I, I I think though, and you know, I'm I'm I hope I don't lose your sympathy when I say this. Uh, I think, in principle, it is possible to engineer uh, a computer that gives a damn. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, 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 it needs to uh, have certain uh, properties, uh, which um, that those properties, I think, we uh, uh, pretty much along the lines of what I was just saying to you, that those properties which we infer, uh, which we, which we, uh, on the basis of, you know, decades and decades of neuroscience research, we we've come to. Uh, an understanding of how consciousness, or at least I think we, I believe we've come to an understanding of how consciousness is generated in the brain. And uh, the the famous um, late uh, R Richard Feynman, the, the physicist, had, uh, when he died, uh, there was something written on his blackboard, so it's not quite his last words, but pretty close to them. Uh, and what was written on his blackboard was, if I can't create it, I don't understand it. But, yeah. yeah. So, so that's my. I, I agree with that. So, I, I, when I said I think that we have understood the basic functional architecture whereby consciousness is generated in the brain, uh, and if that's true, then we should be able to reverse engineer it. And so, um, as I said, I hope you don't think I'm a nutter when I say that. Uh, but I do, I do think uh, that 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 in principle must be possible. No. Otherwise, we don't understand. It. I don't think we are actually. I don't mean not of the same this. And it's interesting because you are just blowing all my questions away because um, you just answering them before I ask them. Um, because now we're going into a question I have for you, which in Mish was, and I think we should just address it now. Was do you think we will ever be in or I mean, is it in principle possible? And two, we ever get to a point where we can create a conscious agent. That was the question. Um, so, uh, let me, uh, rather than repeat myself, let me tell you <laughs> about uh, a project that I am currently engaged um, with a team of uh, colleagues, um, both uh, at, at my university, but also as some of them um, from uh, the United States and some of them from from Holland. Um, we are we are so this is the I, I will just summarize for you the the functionality that uh, that we are um, that we are uh, engineering uh, for our artificial uh, agent. Uh, it is first of all a self-organizing system, um, which which means that it is the uh, I mean, in, in Ross Ashby's sense of the word, you know, it's a it's a it's a system which is which is uh, has one um, purpose and aim only, 
and that is to continue existing as a system. Uh, so, and that is all that we that we write into it that it must do whatever is necessary to continue existing. Um, that means that it has to. I mean, any system uh, has to separate itself from its environment uh, because otherwise it won't continue existing. So that's the basic. I mean, every living thing is, as we call it, blanketed. Uh, we use the technical uh, term from from Markov. You know, the statistical, uh, uh, the defining of the set of what is in the system and what is not in the system. It's called a Markov blanket. And and the basic idea there uh, is that. Um, you know, continuing to exist uh, as a, a thing uh, means to resist entropic dissipation. So uh, the, 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 the fundamental um, goal, uh, and I'll use the word advisedly, because remember I'm saying this is a system that gives a damn. Uh, it is trying uh, to continue existing. It has an existential need. So, uh, um, just to explain to anyone who's listening, <laughs> Um, I think it's, it's worth maybe talking a bit about what entropy is. Um, it's been interesting talking about this term as a measure of disorder, right? So yes, yes. I think that the crucial, the crucial, uh, it's disorder. Yes, and uh, the crucial um, aspect of disorder that I uh, want to pause round is dissipation. So let me use a concrete example. And um, if 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 you have a cold bathtub. Uh, and you open the hot tap, uh, the hot water uh, that enters the cold tub uh, doesn't uh, remain uh, separate from the cold water in some sort of globule. Uh, it dissipates. So it ceases to exist as hot water. It equalizes with the cold water. That's entropy. Um, now, we living things, um, we don't do that. Uh, what we do uh, is we seek to remain as a globule. To, to, to keep ourselves separate from uh, the the surrounds. So so let me use exactly the analogy I'm using there. Um, I am currently, um, we, we human beings have to be roughly 37 degrees Celsius. You know, we, ha we have to remain between 36 and a half and 37 and a half degrees. Uh, the, the environment outside of me at the moment, I would say is about 20 degrees. Uh, if I equalize with my environment, I would die. Uh, so I have to. So my body has to work. It has to do something in order to maintain me within my viable bounds, and that work is anti-entropic. So it's resisting entropy. It's resisting dissipation. It's keeping me uh, in with my viable uh, bounds. So this is what we're engineering into our uh, artificial agent. Uh, that it too has viable bounds. Uh, it has. Um, we call it um, uh, uh, in in uh, computational terms. It's a it's a prior it's a joint prior preference distribution. That there are certain states uh, that the that the uh, agent um, needs to maintain. Uh, like for example, it has to continue to uh, have a sufficient energy supply. Uh, if its battery runs down, it's 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 gone. It's no longer the system is no longer there. You know, so it has to maintain. Uh, its energy resources, uh, and everything that it does uh, is driven by that goal. I, you know, I need to maintain, uh, I need to remain within a certain uh, uh, power supply range, uh, which means I've got to find sources of power and plug myself in, uh, otherwise uh, I'm going to cease to exist. Um, and uh, you, you see the language I'm using, it's, it's very anthropomorphic. So let me just, let me just go, go a step back from, back to the basics. So you asked me to explain what I mean by entropy. Uh, that's what I mean. Th that, that example I just gave you, it's a mechanism called homeostasis. All living things function uh, by homeostasis. Th that is how they maintain their viable bounds. So each living thing has its phenotypic viable bounds. Uh, so like for us, uh, we, we, we have to be breathing in air. You know, sharks need to be uh, respir uh, respiring uh, water. Uh, so that you know, we we ha we have we do very different things depending on our phenotype. Uh, so well, an an, an artificial uh, consciousness uh, has to maintain an electricity supply. You know, and, and uh, so um, these these things. Um, remember, I'm talking about a system which 
sequesters itself from its environment. In other words, it has a point of view. Think back to what I was saying earlier about subjectivity. Uh, it, it has a point of view. And now the question is, but is there something it is like to be such a system? And it has a point of view. In other words, it, there's a system and a non-system. And uh, this agent, this system, has to learn how to meet its needs in the outside world. Um, now, uh, I'm asking, does it feel uh, that? So let me go down to the most basic level uh, uh, and say that uh, what it needs to do, um, it, because it has needs, um, it, 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 its energy supply running down is so just an it's in the anterior. You just said that because it has needs. Yeah. Where do those arise from? Where, where do the needs come from? From the fundamental, um, the fundamental mechanism that's encoded into this system, like it is into you and me, uh, and every other living thing, is that I must do whatever is necessary to continue existing. Uh, that there's, there's a, this is a value system. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, quickly, that's really important. That biology, uh, I mean, natural selection uh, is the expression of a value system, which is it is good to survive. And yeah. it's bad to die. Okay. Uh, and the whole of natural selection is driven by that mechanism. It's a, it's a mechanism. It's, it's a natural side, side, natural uh, uh, mechanism uh, uh, of the most fundamental kind. Uh, and our, our artificial agent is, 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 uh, we are engineering that it functions by that same mechanism. That means our agent has a value system. And, and then all of that means then arise from this most fundamental ground, which is continuing to survive. Absolutely. So, uh, so you know, you and I have, uh, I just mentioned the need to stay within a certain temperature range. We also have the need to stay within a certain oxygen uh, in relation to our blood gases. We have to ba have a certain balance of oxygen to carbon dioxide, uh, water to salt ratio. Uh, there's a certain... Um, uh, uh, sugar level that we need in our blood, uh, and you know, and so on and so on. A certain amount of sleep that we need to get. All of these needs uh, are um, categories of components uh, of our overarching need to survive. Um, so our agent, our artificial agent, is engineered like that. It has a range of needs, um, and uh, I've so far only spoken about energy supply. Uh, it, it also has a viable temperature range. Uh, it, 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 it also, uh, therefore, needs to rest uh, in order to cool down uh, and so on. Uh, and this is important for the following reason. Let me just reiterate. It has need. I don't shy away from that word because I don't know what else to call it. I mean, the, the system has needs. Otherwise, it ceases to exist as a system. Uh, and I ask, does it feel those needs? Well, not necessarily because, you know, it's a... Con you could say, well, there's just a continuous variable called need. Uh, and so that's just a quantity. Uh, but critically, what I've just introduced, the idea of categories of need, um, categorical variables uh, are qualitatively distinct from each other. Uh, they're not quantitatively distinct. If, in other words, 8 out of 10 of sleepiness is not the same as 8 out of 10 of thirst. In way, they are qualitatively different and for, for, for crucial biological reasons. If you said, uh, okay, uh, I've got 8 out of 10 uh, of sleepiness and I've got 8 out of 10 of thirst, that means I've got 16 out of 20 of total need, so I'll just see. Is there, uh, that'll reduce the quantity, you know, and have never drink. Uh, yeah. If you did that, you would die. Yeah. So you have to, these categories of need, each of them has to be met in their own right. That is why they have to be treated as categorical variables. Categorical variables, as I said, are qualitatively distinct from each other. So now we're talking about an agent uh, which has a point of view, uh, which is balanced. In other words, there's a goodness and badness uh, to uh, its, its uh, perspective uh, uh, on, on what to make of events. You know, events are making things better or worse for it in terms of its, only, its fundamental need, which is to continue existing. Uh, but then that need uh, is is categorized across these categorical variables, which means that this agent has a point of view where it's having to register its own state uh, qualitatively. 
And, yeah. and for me, that's just the ground zero of what philosophers call qualia. In other words, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a an, an, an agent which is imbued with subjectivity, uh, which is, uh, which has existential quality and, and value to it. Uh, and the, and those, those, uh, 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 the, the, those valued, uh, or balanced uh, need states uh, are qualitatively distinctive. To me, that just is what a feeling is. And that's, that is what an affect is. It's yeah. like hunger or sleepy little sort those. That's what it is. So, uh, I could tell you more because then there's the whole question of, uh, you know, uh, what kind of decision making process does our agent use? Uh, it, it uses a thing called partially observable. Uh, it, it's a POM DP, a uh, partially observable mark of decision process. And, uh, it so uses active inference, uh, where it's, it, it's inferring. Uh, it's 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 oh, generating uh, predictions uh, 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 and counterfactual predictions and making decisions as to uh, if I did that, what would happen to uh, my need state? Uh, and it's making it's feeling its way through through its problems uh, is 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 the way that that I would put it. Uh, it is using Billy's glossalia. Yeah, okay, I think there's something important you just touched upon, and. Yeah, for me, it's saying uh, really a big, but at least for me, this was something I didn't know prior to it or book, and it seems like a really important fundamental thing to understand, which I think he was stressing in the book, which is what you just said right now, that feelings are really value functions of my current state. So you use your feelings to sort of drive yourself, or the way you put it, feel yourself through situations. Yeah. Uh, is is the, am I placing too much of an importance in that, or do you think it's really important? No, but, no, I think it. I think it is really important. Uh, so, so let me let me uh, elaborate on that quite for a moment. Um, I've said that the fundamental mechanism uh, of our artificial agent, modelled on us, uh, living things, uh, is homeostasis. Now, homeostasis just works like this: that there's I need to be there. Uh, that's the temperature range or the water range or the uh, 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 blood sugar range or whatever. That's where I need to be. A deviation from that is bad for me. So mm -hmm. that's just bad. Um, and you have to have a prediction about what to do in order to restore homeostasis. So if I get too hot, um, I have reflexes uh, like uh, perspiration uh, and panting. You know, uh, that your, your breathing becomes shallower and more rapid, and that cools you down. Um, same applies to all of our needs. So, so I, I have um, a, a need for a certain amount of oxygen and a certain amount of carbon dioxide. How that works is, uh, when my carbon dioxide level goes up and my oxygen level goes down, I have a reflex which does this. I breathe in, uh, and then that increases my oxygen, and then I breathe out that decreases my carbon dioxide and then I breathe in and then I breathe out. So please note these, so these homeostatic mechanisms are autonomic. There's their reflexes. There's, now the question is, where does feeling come in? That's your question. Yeah. So imagine that, um, imagine you're in a, a, now, I mean, only because I'm speaking to you about breathing, you're aware of it, but normally you're not. Okay. You're not normally aware of your need for oxygen. But imagine now you find yourself in an unpredicted situation, a situation for which your reflex uh, is not an adequate prediction, you like a carbon dioxide filled room. Uh, uh, you're, you're in a carbon dioxide filled room, breathing in, breathes in carbon dioxide. You know, so it doesn't, if it doesn't, the, 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 the reflex prediction doesn't work anymore. So now what do you do? Uh, what you do is stochastic behavior. In other words, you do random random stuff because you don't know what to do you're in a state of uncertainty um and some of uh, in that situation if you do something random maybe you'll get lucky and you'll live uh, but most likely you won't you'll die you know because there's all manner of options of what to do um, if you can feel your homeostatic state that are things getting worse for me or are they getting better for me then you can make choices mm -hmm. uh, Feeling guides choice. In other words, feeling is the mechanism whereby voluntary behavior arises. So, I'm in the burning, uh, I've never been in a burning building before, let alone this particular one. I don't know what to do. 
So I go upstairs. Uh, as I do that, I feel worse. Uh, my air hunger, uh, my suffocation distress increases. Uh, that's how I know that was a bad choice. So I change my mind and I go downstairs. And then, oh, there's a god. There, I feel the relief. Uh, that is because I'm feeling my homeostatic state, which rises me above the level of, of autonomic reflex uh, to the level of voluntary behavior. That's what feeling is for. That's what feeling enables uh, the, the system to do. It, it feels its way through the problem, and this guides this guides choice. And, and, and this, is, this is what feeling is for. Uh, then it becomes a matter of, um, I feel like this about that. Uh, and so the feeling is applied to the context, and hence we have perceptual uh, 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 and, and cognitive consciousness too. But it starts with feeling. Uh, and, and going back to what we were saying earlier about zebrafish, I'm not sure that the zebrafish has much more than just the feeling. I don't think it's thinking, you know, shall I go there or shall I go there? And, and, and pondering the meaning of life. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's doing a hell of a lot of that. But does it have raw feeling? Well, all the evidence, uh, experimental evidence suggests it sure does. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. And we, like, I, yeah. It's a theory I'm um, pretty willing to, to accept and because I went to the same before we started um, this meeting, I went on control theory and we talk about value functions there um, that we use to get to certain states and um, maybe it's a robot trying to walk in environment or trying to avoid obstacles and we also use gradients of these functions to drive us to some desired location. So. The theory and myth that we use in control theory in robotics um, sounds very aligned with that. Um, Absolutely, it is. I mean, the the um, the principle I've just described to you is a, the homeostatic principle I've just described is a feedback principle. It it is a cybernetic uh, mechanism. Absolutely, it, it is a, 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 a product of control theory. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, I'm. Let me ask you this question now. Uh, you've answered most of these questions already, but let's talk about... Um, okay, so Donald Hoffman um, talks about, in his book, um, The Case Against Reality. So he has this idea of... Um, I mean, the title of the book sort of says it all, right? The case against reality. And this theory is sort of like, basically, in, in simple terms, reality is an interface. Um, so when I see the mouse that's on my table right now, it's, I should interpret it the same way I interpret the icon from Microsoft Word on my computer. It's a representation of something that's actually out there. But for me to believe that this mouse is exactly like that in, 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 in outside reality would be a mistake. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with his ideas on that, but I think when I was reading the book, I didn't um, get a sense that when he said, what you just seen is just that a scene, a constructed perspective upon reality, not reality itself. So I suppose um, you're in line with him there. I am, um, but I want to say two qualifying things. Uh, the first thing is that I don't know why uh, everybody's got their knickers in a twist about Donald Hoffman. Uh, I mean, this is what Immanuel Kant said in the 18th century. Uh, it, 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 the the um, transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant, uh, where he draws a distinction between phenomena and noumena. In other words, uh, the, the 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 reality as we perceive it, um, as opposed to reality itself, uh, the thing that we are representing perceptually. Yeah. I mean, you know, you 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 just all you need to do is observe that uh, light waves uh, in, in, impinge on or impact upon the rods and cones in our retina, okay. uh, which transduce the light waves into nerve impulses. Uh, so. You're not getting light actually coming into your head, as you're getting a representation of the light in the form of spike trains, you know, ones and zeros. 
Uh, that's that's all the brain is actually receiving. Um, and, I mean, literally, ones and zeros is what the brain is receiving. Is the, the neuron fires or it doesn't fire. So the pattern of spike trains, it, it, the brain uh, then interprets that pattern and generates an image in our brains, uh, which is what we see. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a construction by the brain. Uh, it's an interpretation of what are these ones and zeros. Uh, uh, it's an inference is the term that I use. Uh, and that's not just me who uses that. I mean, the whole, the whole of computational neuroscience these days is dominated by uh, a, a framework which we call active inference, uh, which is I'm actively inferring uh, the causal dependencies uh, outside there in the world, beyond my blanket, beyond my mop of blanket. You know, so you remember my, uh, I am, uh, I am this, this, uh, uh, blanketed, I, there's a membrane, as it were, that separates me from the world. I can only register the state of my membranes. You know, I, I, I can, they represent what's out there. As I said, the light wave, uh, it, it, is, it, it affects the state of my retina, but it is not the light wave itself. It's the state of my retina uh, that I register. So, and then on the basis of those states, I infer what is out there. So, and th th that, as I'm saying, is patently common sense. I mean, it can't be otherwise. Uh, and, and what is more, uh, Immanuel Kant said it in the 1700s. So, you know, I don't know why they call this the case against reality or, you know, why it's like, wow, you know, Donald Hoffman has turned the world upside down. Uh, it, it is, it, it, please note um, the... Kant was called a transcendental idealist. In other words, he didn't say that all that exists is our perception. He says there's something out there uh, that is jet that, that that our perception is modeling, is in, is inferring. Uh, but all that we are aware of is our perception of the, what is out there. So it's not that there's no reality. It's just that we mustn't confuse our representation of reality with reality in itself. That was Kant's term. Ding, the, the the thing anzik, the thing in itself, as opposed to our perception of it. Um, now, uh, that's the one thing I wanted to say about Donald Hoffman, is there's nothing new there. That, and it's bloody obvious. It can't be otherwise. You know, colors don't exist in the world. We construct colors to, you know, to, 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 to differentiate uh, and, and luminosity and the light, the, the, the wavelengths of light. Uh, but the, 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 that's color. Color is a product of the brain. Wavelengths of light are what exist out there in the world. Now, the second thing I want to say about Donald Hoffman is actually more interesting to me. It is that you can't, so that's called illusionism. That's what they, uh, is that Donald Hoffman is an illusionist. Uh, mm -hmm. a reality is an illusion, and you can see why he says that. Uh, but when it comes to feelings, this is the point I want to make. Can you say that a feeling is an illusion? Uh, you know, th this is our subjective state uh, of our, our, our own uh, uh, being, our own the state of our own system. Uh, and remember everything I said earlier about what existential consequences it has and so on and why we have feelings at all. Can you ever say that a feeling is an illusion? Um, that, does, that to me doesn't make sense. Uh, you can't say, I mean, let's say you, you're depressed. Uh, you know. I, I, so Kutler says, I'm depressed. I can't say, no, you're not. It's an illusion. <laughs> you just are depressed. That's it. That's being sense an interpretation of something out there in the same sense that out there I'm seeing red. I, I think there is a difference. There's a difference when it comes to the state uh, of your of your own homeostatic uh, systems, uh, because there you you are in direct concept, contact uh, with those homeostatic systems uh, in the state of feeling. So, like as I said, you can say it's not justified that the Kutler's depressed, or it's not justified that Kushler is e experiencing pain. Uh, in other words, you know, the, what the pain is about uh, is, 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 is questionable, um, what the depression is about, uh, but the fact that you actually are experiencing pain, uh, or you are experiencing uh, depression, or, or fear, or, or anything for that matter, feelings, I think, we can't speak of them as illusions. And, and why am I saying all of this? It goes right back to what I was saying at the very beginning, Kufri, is that subjectivity is part of nature. It is part of reality. So that part of reality uh, that that we uh, ourselves occupy uh, in the form of experiences, experiences are are real in the psychical sense of the word. Psych 
psychical reality is part of reality. So I, I, this is why I don't like to think of it. Uh, um, uh, I don't follow uh, the, the logic uh, that this is a case against reality. It's, it's a recognizing of one of the properties, one of the uh, co constituent parts of reality uh, is this thing called consciousness, uh, the most rudimentary, fundamental form of which is feeling. Uh, and and I haven't gone through that whole story uh, as to why I say that, but uh, I I do firmly believe that the elemental form of consciousness is feeling. Uh, all of the rest of it is an elaboration and an application of feeling. As I said earlier, I, I feel like this is the fundamental thing, and then it's I feel like this about that. That is that is a, a, an elaboration of the basic mechanism. But all that I'm saying is that feeling is part of reality. Uh, and uh, we, 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 if we exclude that, um, if it's, which is by implication what the word, um, what the term, the phrase, uh, the case against reality, it's implying, you know, that that feelings are not part of reality. Uh, in other words, consciousness is not is not part of reality. And I'm saying no, no, it's not. It's part of reality, but it's this very special part of reality. It's the part that we ourselves occupy and register directly. We register our own states directly as feelings. And they're not illusions. What you what you're saying, um, with some some people have been thinking about it as we've been talking to as well. I realize uh, some of the people who work in these areas tend to this area of consciousness specifically tend to categorize themselves into mm -hmm. whether or not they're a psychist or they're a humanist or they're just a materialist. Um, do you categorize yourself into these terms? Yes. Yes, I do. First of all, um, I say uh, emphatically, I, I am not a panpsychist, but I do not believe that there is something it is like to be everything. I don't think that there's something it is like to be a puff of smoke. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think there's something it is like uh, uh, to be a cloud, uh, a book or a grain of sand, uh, etc. Uh, I think that these uh, that that uh, there is some, that many things exist in the universe um, that um, have no um, no feeling. It, 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 it feels like nothing to be those things. But nevertheless, they exist. In fact, let me go further and say um, the Big Bang uh, happened a very long time ago. Uh, and uh, then um, the universe um, you know, came into being uh, for a very long time before life emerged. Uh, and I think that life uh, existed for a very long time before conscious life existed. You know, it's, it's so, so consciousness uh, it is something that comes way down the line. That a panpsychist would have to say that consciousness exists with the Big Bang. I mean, that's like the idea of God. You know, it's not a, uh, it, it, it's it's not a it's not a tenable scientific view. Um, that everything we know about uh, that consciousness, that what I've summarized for you in our discussion about how it's a it's something that emerges from natural selection. Um, it's, it's somewhere down the line from bacteria. You know the a little, a, a little bacteria. Uh, it, it's, uh, you, you, you're going to learn. You need to have multiple needs, uh, and you need to be able. That, that I will only assign consciousness to a system, whether it be a biological system uh, or an artificial system. If I see evidence of voluntary behavior, uh, I see evidence not that this thing always does the same thing in response to uh, a, a stimulus. But when it, when it finds itself in an unpredicted, uncertain situation, it can survive by making choices, um, which uh, 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 and and that that is the objective criterion by which uh, I'm willing to assign uh, subjectivity in the psychological sense of the word. In other words, to assign a psyche. So I'm not a panpsychist. Um, now, what am I? Um, well, uh, the the technical term for my metaphysical position. Is dual aspect monism. That was a, a, a position that was espoused by Baruch Spinoza uh, also hundreds of years ago. But although I'm, I, I, I must tell you, I actually came to that view myself. I was very sad to learn that I was a few hundred years uh, too late uh, to be able to claim the right. Uh, but 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 uh, the dual aspect monism basically, yeah, I've I've, I've sort of already uh, explained it uh, when I said earlier uh, I spoke about what is a mind. It's got to do with observational perspectives. Uh, it is when when uh, I wake up in the morning, before I open my eyes, uh, I experience myself 
I am Mark Solms, I, I exist, that's my mind. Um, then I walk over to the bathroom and I see this body in the mirror, and that's also Mark Solms. Okay, these are two observational perspectives upon Mark Solms, the subjective being of Mark Solms and the objective thing of Mark Solms. Um, they are one and the same. That's why it's dual aspect modism. In other words, uh, these are two different ways uh, of perceiving one and the same reality. Okay, what is what, what do we call that reality? Uh, well, I, I, I say uh, it's physical in the sense of physics. Uh, in other words, um, I, I'm not saying... Uh, I, I think the fundamental nature of reality is physical in the sense of physics. In other words, in, in the sense of the, the basic uh, forces and energies uh, uh, that, that we can infer from observation. We infer these basic things. Um, and so the one that I think is most pertinent when it comes to uh, the, the, the heart of nature that we are talking about is uh, is what, what we call information. Um, so the physics of uh, statistical physics, the physics of information, um, I think is the is the the language that we sh that we should use to describe in monistic terms, uh, which which explains the behavior both of the mind and of the brain. In other words, uh, that these two appearances of one and the same thing, uh, the thing that we are observing in these two different ways, is an information processing system, uh, yeah. uh, 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 which which obeys the laws of statistical physics. Uh, and uh, in that sense, that I, I I'm a physicalist, uh, a dual aspect monist, and the modist part is physicalist. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you for your response there. And I think a question that's for me at least very interesting. Um, and yeah, I want it to be our last question here. So again, Dolan Hoffman laments uh, that one existing theories of consciousness, uh, global web space theories, um, integrated information theory, um, all these theories that oh, yeah, I think. Something to do with uh, micro tubules. I think that's um, to one hammer off and hope. Oh, yep. Ah, yeah, so things like that. But he laments that all these theories don't can't tell us how, you know, you get to smell coffee or taste chocolate. Um, so he's putting his efforts towards getting there. And I think that's important. Though I think that is important. I think for me personally, I think the thing that's most interesting is how does the thing that experiences arise you know, how does the thing that are that that smells the coffee and tastes the chocolate um i think that will still be the most important thing because i see smelling coffee with test of chocolate is just like a function right that maps reality to an interpretation that the thing that is me has but how does the thing that is me arise i think that would be the most important question do you agree with me there i absolutely agree with you and uh I, I would go further and say that um, this conversation that we've just had, uh, I have been trying to answer exactly that question. Uh, why, why, how does subjectivity arise? Why does it exist at all? Uh, uh, why does it feel like something to be uh, a, 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 a subject? Uh, that is the, 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 the fundamental feature of consciousness, that it feels like something. And uh, I have tried to give a mechanistic explanation of how that arises. But I, I think that um, Donald Hoffman's uh, disappointment with theories of consciousness um, would, would uh, be ameliorated if he would read my book. Because <laughs> it is exactly that uh, that, I'm, that I'm addressing. I'm trying to account for, that in, in natural scientific terms, uh, how do qualia arise? How and why? Uh, and uh, I, I do not... Um, uh, uh, sympathize with uh, the, the the David Chalmers uh, and and his lot uh, who say that you know that that the qualia, uh, um, that that consciousness cannot be accounted for in ordinary natural scientific physicalist terms uh, and uh, I put my money where my mouth is uh, in that book and and now we are trying to engineer uh, such a system as I said and uh, if you can engineer a system that feel, uh, then you know you 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 have accounted for it mechanistically, uh, and I believe that it, that is possible. I sincerely do believe so. Yeah, um, that's very, I guess, inspiring. Um, and yeah, I'll keep looking out for your work, and I guess um, 
as you said earlier on, you are hoping that you still have more time to put in this kind of work, and I hope so too. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, as I suspected I would, but I think I enjoyed it more than I had expected, and I hope we get to chat again in the future. Me too, Kukla. Uh, I, I hope so, and, and uh, in fact, I confidently predict that it will happen. So, thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you Cheers. Cheers.